Hi guys, and welcome back. In today's video, we're going to talk about the connectedness between SIBO and restless leg syndrome. Stay tuned, we're going to talk about what are the contributing factors to RLS, how SIBO plays a role, and if treating your SIBO will lead to symptomatic improvement in your restless legs. But first, I have two primers to talk about before we get into the nitty gritty of this conversation. So first of all, SIBO and restless leg syndrome are very highly associated. Depending on the study that you look at, of which there are several, you're gonna look at numbers somewhere between about 50 and sometimes 70% of people with restless legs are said to in fact have SIBO. So that's pretty compelling considering that healthy normals in most studies usually range from about five to 20% diagnosis of SIBO. So 50 to 70% is pretty darn significant. Another way to think about the data is that if you have IBS, which we know is highly, highly associated with SIBO, you have about a threefold higher likelihood of being diagnosed with restless legs. So that also is pretty compelling. Similarly, if you are diagnosed with restless leg syndrome, there's about a fourfold increased likelihood that you also have IBS. So it seems like IBS, SIBO, restless leg syndrome, they're all kind of mishmash together in this picture that then gets diagnosed and heaven forbid, you know, sent out to specialists, you go to a sleep person for your RLS, you go to the GI doctor for your SIBO, but it's all connected. So why don't we talk about it in one conversation and come up with a holistic treatment plan? The other thing I wanna share with you is that I find that a lot of people don't really get what restless leg syndrome actually is. I have some check boxes on my intake forms when I work with new patients and I ask them if they have restless legs and I'm finding that quite a few people check yes to that check box. But when I actually get talking to them about it and I ask them to describe restless legs, it ranges most often from yeah, like, uh, I, you know, my muscles feel tight if I don't do my yoga, or um, some people will describe it like they have a jerk or a twitch when they're falling asleep. Um, some people, you know, say, describe it in another way. But as somebody who's had restless leg syndrome, bona fide RLS before, I'll describe it to you this way. If you're not describing your RLS in a similar way, then it's probably not true bona fide RLS. It could be another thing that you're dealing with. But the way that I described it, I had restless leg syndrome for a couple of years in high school. And I remember it drove me crazy. Like I would be perfectly normal throughout the duration of the entire day. I would get home, I would get ready for bed, I would lay down in bed and my brain and my body were ready to fall asleep and that I had this urge, like this really deep, like in your bones urge that I had to move my legs. And you know, like you have to stretch, but it's really nagging at you. And it's, it really is just like a deep, urgent feeling, feeling like, oh, I have to move my legs right now. And so, you know, you do, I, I would kind of stretch or I would kind of, reposition myself or maybe I would do a couple little like leg fluttery movements and I would think oh okay that's good it just needed a little bit more blood flow or whatever it might be and I would lay back down again and immediately my legs would say nope we've got to move again oh my god oh my god and I would have that same deep feeling like I just I really need to move my legs and I've gone through periods of my life where it's popped back a little bit like it did come back on me a little bit in pregnancy and I remember, you know, like my husband saying, well, why don't you just get up and walk around for a minute? Or why don't you stretch for a minute? And I would try and it didn't always do the trick. Sometimes if I got up in the night and I would do like 20 or 30 minutes of like yoga stretching, sometimes that would work. But very often it wouldn't. It was just this nagging, annoying, and yet deep and significant feeling like I, I simply had to move my legs. And the moment my legs were still again. It was like, never even happened. I needed to move them again. So that's how I would describe restless leg syndrome. If you're not describing it with that kind of descriptive, like the urgency, like you can't fight it and like this deep nagging feeling, then it's probably not bona fide restless leg syndrome. It might be a muscle twitch or some tight muscles or something else that you're dealing with as opposed to restless legs. 
And of course, that all being said, so if you think you're in the right place, now let's talk about some of the hypotheses as to what actually drives restless leg syndrome. So you can see I've got a couple of things coming in in all directions, and we're going to talk about SIBO in the context of all of these, because really a lot of it does go back to SIBO for a lot of people. So we have this symptom of restless legs. We have this almost uncontrollable deep-seated urge to move our legs in a very inconvenient time when we're trying to rest. And that, of course, has several different things that are correlated with it and hypotheses. But the the biggest hypothesis for this, the biggest overarching thing that you can think about is that it is a malfunctioning of some part of your nervous system. Whether it's the peripheral nerves, meaning the nerves in the legs themselves, in the spinal cord, the brain stem, the brain, the cerebellum, we can get into the nuance of naming the bits, but just think about it from a perspective of, okay, one or more of your neurons is not functioning quite as well as it could. It's either hyperreactive or hyporeactive, and it's not quite synapsing and making those connections in the most efficient way possible. Then we can think about it from a perspective of, okay, well, what, what, would, what would hinder a neuron's ability to do its job well? Because your neurons want to do their job well. It's just they need the tools and they need the right substrate and the right environment to do that. One of those, that is hypothesized with RLS is immune dysregulation or inflammation or both. Oftentimes they will go hand in hand. And of course we know, if you've watched any of my videos certainly, that SIBO can cause inflammation and immune dysregulation because you have, your immune system is burdened by this bacteria in your small bowel and it's trying to clear that for you. It's trying to fight that fight for you. So. If your immune system is overburdened, it can become dysregulated and we can get inflammation from that or the leaky gut or the deficiencies or the other stuff that goes along with SIBO. But certainly SIBO can cause inflammation and immune dysregulation, which then can tick off your neurons and make it hard for them to do their job. Another thing that I found really interesting, I'm gonna link a study or two in the doobly-doo down below for you guys. But another thing that I found really interesting is this hypothesis of central nervous system, so that would be brain, cerebellum, spinal cord, brainstem, central nervous system, hyper excitability. And there was one article that talked about the overlay between that and what we call visceral hypersensitivity. So think of it this way. Um, I'm going to explain both of these and then we're going to mesh them together. Visceral hypersensitivity is one of the hallmarks of irritable bowel syndrome and not surprisingly, is fairly common with people with SIBO. And the way you can think of it is that visceral hypersensitivity is when you feel pain or an unpleasant symptom from a non-painful stimulus. So as food moves through your digestive tract, as you have little gas bubbles, as your poo moves its way through your colon, that should not elicit a painful response. Actually, you shouldn't really perceive that much at all. But if you do perceive it, it should be kind of whatever, like oh, no big deal. For people with irritable bowel syndrome and SIBO and people who have a lot of inflammation in their gut or a lot of immune dysregulation in their gut, they can, they can become hypersensitive. So those same neurons that live in your gut start picking up on that stimuli and they start shooting off pain signals at inappropriate times. So your body is perceiving pain when it should not be in pain. The same thing can happen, this hyper excitability in the central nervous system. It's like you have neurons firing off and making synapses at inappropriate times and they're doing so more frequently than they should be doing. So it's this, this dysregulated pathway, this dysregulated central nervous system that they think is part of what causes restless legs. Because I believe, if I remember correctly, I think somewhere I read that restless leg syndrome is actually considered a movement disorder. So it makes sense that that would be central nervous system involvement. So we're talking about really deep centers of the brain and the cerebellum and where they're dysfunctioning. But this central nervous system hyperexcitability and hyperalgesia, this feeling of pain from something that should not be painful, is common amongst people with irritable bowel syndrome, both local to the gut and elsewhere. 
And it's that same thing, hyperalgesia, this feeling pain from a non-painful stimulus is common amongst people with restless legs. So when they test and they do a pinprick test or cold or heat or something that is, is supposed to be a painful stimuli, people with restless legs have an overly, um, an overly painful experience to something that should only be a little bit painful. Those neurons are hyper excitable. And of course, we know that neurons can't do their dang job when they're inflamed or when they have deficiencies and they don't have the proper fuel and the proper environment to do their job. So very, very likely that the inflammation and the immune dysregulation, perhaps caused by SIBO or dysbiosis or something else, is looping back around and giving your neurons a hard time. And then that is the connectedness with the restless legs. Then you get this movement disorder, you get this, this uncontrollable urge to move your muscles, and then boom, now you have restless legs. The last thing that I really wanted to draw your attention to is another condition that is very, very associated with restless legs is iron deficiency. Holy macaroni, you wanna talk about something that is very common amongst people with RLS? And looking back, I think I had SIBO in the past. I never got diagnosed. I don't know if you guys all know my story by now, but I look back and I had a lot of symptoms of SIBO when I was in grad school. But looking back at high school, I don't think I had SIBO, not from what I re recollect. But I look back, I was a vegetarian from the age of 11 to 22. So I do think I probably was at least moderately iron deficient for a lot of my high school years. And it was really high school when my restless leg syndrome was the worst. And then, like I said, it got better for a while and it kind of came back in pregnancy a bit. But I actually think that this was my RLS root cause. I don't necessarily think I had SIBO back in the day. So iron deficiency. Similarly, if we're crunching the numbers, you know, SIBO, I've seen numbers ranging from 50 to maybe 70% for folks with restless legs. Similarly, iron deficiency, I, I actually believe, no, I'm going to scribble that out. I think that most of the numbers I've seen are closer to that 70% mark. So iron deficiency anemia might actually beat this out. And keep in mind, you can be iron deficient without full-blown anemia. So yeah, you can look at your red blood cells, your hemoglobin, your hematocrit, but also pay attention to ferritin. For ferritin, you want that number above 50, 5 -0. That is way higher than LabCorp's reference range, but numerous studies support that. You want your iron and your iron saturation to be within the normal range, and you want a number called TIBC to be in the bottom half of the range. Otherwise, you're starting to creep up on iron deficiency. So make sure that you're doing your due diligence or make sure that your provider is doing their due diligence. They're not just looking at the CBC. Make sure that somebody is testing your iron and your ferritin at least once a year as, as a rule of thumb. But if you think about this, for all that, so iron deficiency anemia gives you about a four or five fold likelihood that you will be diagnosed with restless legs. So again, a pretty significant correlation between these two. And here's the kicker. Iron deficiency anemia, how do I draw this? How do I, hmm. these arrows are getting too complicated. Iron deficiency is extremely common amongst people with SIBO. It's probably bi-directional in the sense that the iron deficiency can exacerbate the SIBO via, in part, making it difficult for your neurons to do their job. And then neurons ultimately control your motility and then that's what's gonna prevent dang SIBO from occurring. So there's this relationship going backwards where iron deficiency can cause your neurons to do a shoddy job at their job, not that they're not trying. And then you need your neurons to promote motility to eradicate or prevent SIBO. So then you could be stuck in SIBO la la land because you're iron deficient. But similarly, iron deficiency is incredibly common amongst people with IBS and SIBO. And most of the studies have, that I've seen on IBS say that about 50% of people with IBS also have iron deficiency. That's huge. This is this, like head exploding emoji, guys. This is big stuff. Like you are going to be really hard pressed to heal your SIBO if you do not correct your iron deficiency. And both of these things together can create the perfect storm and make it difficult for your neurons to do their job and create inflammation 
and make it hard for you to make stomach acid and make it hard for you to get blood flow to your dang organs. And all of this can accumulate and present as restless leg syndrome and IBS. And then people get told, oh, you have RLS, just take this drug and be, be done with your life. See you later. Or, oh, just you have, you have IBS, just take a round of Rifaximin and you'll be good to go. Or just take, you know, Linzess or whatever it might be and you're good to go. And people get stuck band-aiding symptoms when in actuality they need to tease apart the SIBO, the iron deficiency, maybe give their neurons a little bit of tender love and care. My goodness, the poor neurons have been through so much. And maybe just take a little peek at inflama inflammation markers like C-reactive protein, Glyce A, homocysteine, uh, sed rate. I mean, these are all available with LabCorp. You can run these relatively easily in America at least. Maybe check on your immune system. Like this is routine lab work that can get missed. Have it, like crap, I mean, a CBC and ferritin costs like 10 bucks out of pocket here in America. And hardly any general practitioners or functional practitioners are paying that much attention to it. I've seen so many patients come and work with me who have a ferritin level of like 15 or 20 or 25, and they don't know why they have perpetual SIBO. They don't know why they can't make stomach acid. They don't know why they have sucky motility. And this can be the key for a lot of people, but you've got to evaluate it and figure out where you're at. So guys, I this kind of turned into like a ranting video and I didn't mean it to be, but my goodness gracious, there is so much opportunity to heal restless leg syndrome and overcome it if you treat the underlying causes and the underlying root, roots of the tree. So by all means, treat your SIBO, antimicrobials, prokinetics, probiotics, I mean, you know by now, and also make sure you're paying attention to things like iron, inflammation, immune dysregulation, and maybe give your neurons a little bit of TLC. Make sure that your blood sugar is not swaying all over the place. Maybe take some turmeric. There's so many options. And I really hope that this video helped highlight some of those, give you new ideas, and ultimately help you put together the most appropriate action plan so that you can treat your RLS and get a good night's sleep from one RLS sufferer to another. I know how much it'll drive you crazy. And then if you're not sleeping, guess what? Neurons like sleep. So it becomes this crappy catch-22 of, well, you can't sleep because of the RLS, but then you can't heal the RLS because you're getting crappy sleep. And then, so I really hope this video helps you. As always, comment down below. Do you have restless leg syndrome? Are you, do you have like real legit bona fide RLS? Would you describe it in a similar way that I did or maybe in your own words? Did you think that you had RLS when you came to this video and then lo and behold, you figured out that you don't? Do you have SIBO and restless legs? Has treating one or the other been helpful for you? Tell me all about it in the comments down below. I would love to hear from you. And as always, if you feel that it's appropriate, if you could share this video in any of your SIBO groups, your IBS groups, or your RLS groups, I wanna get this information out to those who need it the most. So any shares and any love along the way would be so, so appreciated. I will see you guys in the next video. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.